students. Well, it looks like it's time to get started. So let's start with section one of chapter one, discussing uh, descriptive statistics and some basic terminology of statistics. So, uh, right, let's uh, get to work then. So, uh, so in this chapter, in this section, we're first going to start out uh, with some basic terminology. Uh, let's start. Let's start out with the uh, data. Data is what it, statistics is interested in. We're going to say that data is basically a collection of facts. We have generally a population or some group of interest for which uh, we want to make some statements. So if we were to collect data for the entire population, then we would have conducted a census. Uh, let's, let's have some examples. There's the classic example of the United States because right now we're actually in a census the 2020 census being conducted by the Census Bureau. And uh, this is a massive undertaking by the U.S. government mandated by the Constitution to count every single individual currently living in the United States. And with that, get uh, to get a count that is supposed to be a complete count, not an estimate, but a count. This becomes the facts of how many people are currently living in the United States. Um, uh, on a smaller scale, uh, there is this class, and I presumably have the grades for this class. So if I were interested in the grades of this class, I could conduct a census by looking at the grades of every single student. And with that, I would have the entire data set, the entire population, where I've defined the population to be uh, this class. Now that said, uh, you may not necessarily have access to the entire population. For example, uh, in the case of the United States, the census is an extremely expensive and complex undertaking that can only be done every 10 years. Uh, and uh, in the case of this class, while I can conduct a census, you yourself as a student may not be able to conduct a census. So uh, if you were interested in how your other fellow students who are doing in the class, you would be forced to collect a sample. A sample is a subset of the population for which you manage to collect data. So in the case of the class, if you were to talk to some of your friends, which may not be the greatest idea anyway, but if you were to talk to some of your friends about uh, how and ask them how they were doing in the class, then you would have conducted a, uh, you would have uh, selected a sample. Uh, whereas um, uh, in the United States, uh, we're regularly uh, subjected to surveys where a subset of the American population is going to be examined uh, and you're going to ask questions about them. And in the case of the Census Bureau, they have a uh, lesser intensity uh, project such as the American Community Survey, which isn't aimed at getting the entire population, I think, Every year they try to get 1% of the population, which is big in and of itself. Uh, all right. So uh, in a sample, we have observations. So maybe these are people, but in principle, they could be just about anything. Like they could be Petri dishes. They could be uh, the price of a stock on a particular day, something like that. And uh, with those observations, we have variables. So in the case of our little person over here who is an observation in our sample, we may have tracked their age. We'll say this person is 22. We may track their gender. Uh, we'll say that this person uh, identifies as male, or maybe we are tracking, I don't know, their uh, occupation. And we'll just say that this person is a student. All right. So univariate data is a data where there's only uh, one variable being tracked. So in this case, if all we did was track age, then this would be a univariate data set. But this is actually a multivariate data set because we're not only tracking age, we're also tracking gender and occupation. So that makes this uh, data set multivariate. Uh, presumably, there's more than just this individual in our sample uh, maybe there are some under it other individuals too for whom we've collected some data in this case this would be a multivariate data set uh, there is kind of a special case for the multivariate case which is the bivariate case and bivariate data 
is a data where there's two variables. And when you have only two variables, at least in this class, we can start talking about ideas such as correlation. How are two uh, variables related to each other? Uh, you can do this for mu general multivariate data too, but that's kind of going uh, beyond the scope of this course. And even then you kind of start out with the bivariate case first. So uh, data itself, uh, the variables can come in different classes such as there can be categorical variables. So an example of categorical would be uh, gender and occupation. These would be categorical variables because there are a finite number of categories that these could be in. Uh, compare that to say age, which we would consider uh, quantitative because what's being tracked is a number, presumably an unbounded number. Now you might think, well, what about say uh, the roll of a dice? If you're rolling a dice, then there's only a finite number of numbers, one through six. This is pretty much a simplification. More with categorical, we're thinking with things where uh, there may or may not be an ordering, but we really don't want to view categorical data necessarily as numbers, per se. Uh, whereas quantitative are numbers, right? And there's also alternative formulations, alternative breakdowns uh, with maybe some more granularity on how you're going to break down data. Like, for example, you might say there's nominal data where it's just categories that have no relation amongst each other. You might then progress to ordinal data where you do add a little bit more structure where one observation, where one value could be considered greater than another. Uh, maybe we could talk about a person's year in college, in which case you would say that sophomore is less than, in some sense, junior, which is less than uh, senior. Uh, Although you don't necessarily want to attach numbers to uh, sophomore, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. And then you could have maybe interval where you're allowed to do addition and ratio where you're allowed to do division. So, uh, but, but yeah, that's an alternative breakdown. Uh, don't worry too much about it. Uh, in modern statistics, we depend very heavily on probability theory. Probability theory is a field of mathematics that describes the behavior of objects in the presence of uncertainty. Uh, the mathematical study of probability, we've known about probability as a species for a very long time, at least since the Greeks, but it's only until around the time calculus was being developed when probability uh, started to take a mathematical interest, and then it was around uh, the beginning of the 20th century where probability became its own proper uh, field in mathematics. So why do statisticians care about probability? How is probability used in statistics? Well, we have this relationship. Um, we have a population. And we have a sample. So a sample is a subset of the population. So the question is, how is it that we get a sample from the population. How, when, when we collect a random sample from the population where every individual in the sample is picked with some with equal likelihood, how will that sample behave? How will statistics computed in that sample such, for, such as, for example, the sample mean, or even then, like going beyond mean, like let's say we track the smallest age how will statistics like that behave? The behavior of those statistics is determined by probability. So probability describes how random samples from a population behave. And as statisticians, we develop probability models for our samples and then use those probability models to describe uh, parameters of the population. So this would be statistics. So probability and statistics are working in inverse directions where probability describes how if you knew the population, how will the sample behave? Whereas statistics is interested in given a sample, how can we infer the properties of the population? Like for example, important population parameters. So, okay. Uh, so uh, let's let's continue on. Uh, 
how we define a population largely depends on our problem. For example, in the examples that I gave before about the United States and my class, uh, we would consider a study involving those populations enumerative studies, since in principle, there is, uh, the population exists. The population exists in physical and temporal space. So uh, that means that there's no, like, you can actually find, in principle, every single individual in the United States, and you can find every single individual in my class, and a census is in fact possible to conduct. Now, uh, compare that instead to analytic studies where the population may not exist. So in my previous example where I was talking about uh, petri dishes as being a potential sample, uh, a petri dish for some bacterial culture is probably going to appear in an analytic study. A lot of those biological studies are going to be analytic studies because the population isn't necessarily considered existing. Uh, if or in a simpler case, if all I wanted to do was determine whether a single dice that I have was fair, in principle, you can't really say that all of the possible roles for this dice exist in some physical temporal space. Uh, I can keep rolling this dice forever. So uh, you can't really consider an enumerative study. So you're just going to say the population is all possible die rolls for this dice. And in the case of a medical study, you might say that the population is all humans, past, present, and future. And we're studying the behavior of some drug in humans. We're, we're thinking of humans as some biological, uh, as a human species, as a biological entity. Uh, not necessarily the current people who are living right now. We would probably want to include future people too. Um, Alright, so uh, statistics is... It depends very crucially on how the data is collected. And we're not actually going to talk very much in this class about how to collect data correctly. I'm just going to leave you a few words. Um, in this class, we're going to assume that data was collected via a simple random sample. So if data was in fact collected via a simple random sample, then in, there is a sense in which every individual in in the population is equally likely to have been chosen. Uh, the metaphor that I like to think of is we have a hat and that hat has little slips of paper and each of those slips of paper will identify uh, individuals in our population. We pull one of the slips of paper at random with equal likelihood from the hat and that gives us an individual in the population that will be included in our sample. Compare that instead to stratified random sampling, which is a more complicated procedure, and the procedure that the Census Bureau is actually going to use in these annual uh, American Community Survey uh, studies, where in this case, you actually divide up your population according to some known strata. A strata is something that you automatically know for individuals in your population, for example, what state they reside in. Uh, so you divide up your population into strata, and those strata don't necessarily have equal size, but you're going to pick a random sample from each strata, a simple random sample as I described before, uh, and then make inferences. And this procedure, the stratification procedure, can increase uh, the power or the ability of your statistical procedure uh, without having to collect as much data. So it's a nice procedure to have in hand. It's the procedure that is being used in more complicated surveys, uh, but we're not going to discuss it here. Uh, the procedures that we discuss here are not appropriate for stratified sampling. Uh, so it's, of course, very easy to sample badly. Uh, so one instance of bad sampling is convenience sampling where you're basically selecting individuals from the population based on how easy it is for you to get the data. Um, in the case of this class, if you were interested in how and what the grades of this class were and you decide to ask some of your friends what their grades are, that's a convenience sample. It is not a random sample because in the end, the sample is going to resemble you in some way. It's going to be more a reflection of you than it is of the class.
So you may end up, if your friends are like better students, and that's because better students like to uh, co-mingle, then that could be a problem because you're not going to get an accurate view. Or uh, let's say we're studying politics and you decide that you want to pe determine people's um, uh, political party affiliation. So you stand outside of the Marriott Library on campus and you start asking students, uh, what party do you support in elections? Uh, in that case, you are not going to get anyone from St. George, Utah, uh, almost sure. Well, I, I mean, you might get a couple people, but for the most part, St. George, Utah will be extremely underrepresented in your sample. Uh, and that's going to be a problem. Now you don't have an accurate representation of the state of Utah. Uh, if that, if the state of Utah were in fact your uh, population of interest, and even if the University of Utah itself were your population of interest, not every student is going to be hanging out around the library. So that'll be a problem. Uh, or in, in the case of a voluntary sampling, where like the classic example is a a TV host goes and tells his viewers to participate in a survey. It's like, who do you like? The Democrats or the Republicans? And it's like, oh my gosh, all my viewers like the same party as I do and they agree with me. No shocker. So that would be a case of a very unreliable study. Um, so uh, yeah, that's, that's another thing. But we're not really going to talk too much about this. Uh, this chapter, this section, I mean, there's a lot that can be said about how to appropriately sample and actually, this is one area where uh, current events, I would like to say some more about it, like the coronavirus. Uh, what are some of the statistical issues surrounding the coronavirus? Because there's a lot of statistical issues involving the coronavirus and our understanding of it and its effect on the population. And I'm thinking I'm going to leave that to a separate video. But for now, that is the end of this section, and uh, I'll see you in section two on pictorial tabular methods in descriptive statistics. So, all right, best of luck to you.